Welcome back. Joining me is my most popular, my most requested guest, someone I admire a lot, investigative journalist and author, Whitney Webb. It's been a while. Whitney, thank you so much for coming back. Of course. My pleasure to be back. Thanks, Natalie. Well, we have a lot to talk about. You've put out some really interesting articles recently. I, I heard some of your talks about AI, but you know what? I'm actually going to start this in a, in a very interesting place because I get so much feedback about my interviews with you. People are like, oh my gosh, we want to hear more from Whitney. And you're literally my most popular guest. And sometimes I hear this feedback. They go, oh my gosh, this woman is so brilliant. That was an amazing interview. Now I'm really depressed about what's happening in the world and where we're all going. I don't know what to do. What do you say to them? Yeah, yeah I mean, people do sort of get that. Um, I mean, <clears throat> and invariably, if you're being like lied to consistently about what's really happening and someone you hear like the other side of what's happening and that resonates more with you, ultimately, I think that's a positive thing, right? Because if we don't know what's actually going on, we can't fix the problem. And you could argue that like a lot of the lies and deception is to keep people from fixing the problem by thinking the problems are all um, other things. But it is depressing to have to confront that disconnect between what you thought was going on and what's actually going on. Um, but ultimately, you have to remember, too, that the reason so much effort and money is poured into deceiving us, it's because we have the power to change it. And a lot of it just comes down to completely like nonviolent things people can do, like divesting from certain companies specifically, you know, lately I've been talking a lot about divesting from big tech as much as possible, just because of like where a lot of those big tech billionaires um, in the national security state, they're completely fused with at this point are taking us, you know, they're a lot of what they are trying to do is entirely predicated on us remaining dependent specifically on their technology when there's a lot of open source alternatives and like other like tech companies or developers that could be supported to develop alternative infrastructure. Like we don't need their tools and those tools can be made differently as an example. Right. So, um, you know, I, I know people sort of like can feel <laughs> black pilled, I guess, uh, when being confronted with this information, but ultimately, you know, um, I think part of the reason things have gotten, to the point they are now is that for so long, so many people didn't want to have to confront that disconnect between the reality we're told and what reality like actually is, you know, like what's actually happening uh, just because, you know, people have been so um, willing to like outsource or, uh, you know, stuff to the government or the private sector or whatever, and not really follow up on it and just assume it's working the way it should. Um, that there a lot of, you know, malfeasance and, and corruption is, has been allowed to entrench itself and grow. And that obviously has to be confronted at some point or it will just keep growing until it completely takes over and destroys everything. And we obviously can't have that happen. So you have to identify the problem to fix the problem. And you have to realistically assess uh, not just what the problem is, but what you can do about it. You know, Whitney, human nature is imperfect. We've always had corruption. And I feel like every adult in every generation says that things were better when they were younger and people were less corrupt. But do you think that we're kind of at this inflection point where things are made worse because of what technology enables? Like, are we living in the most corrupt era because everything potentially is so centralized with these forces? So yeah, centralization, I think is part of it, but also I think, um, you know, there's a lot of people, psychologists specifically that work for, you know, the public relations industry or propaganda arms of governments, for example, or intelligence agencies that have studied very closely how to manipulate human behavior with technology. And I think, um, when you consider that like a lot of social media companies have their origins with intelligence, or if they didn't at the beginning, they certainly do now. Um, and how they know that, you know, the like news feeds on social media can be used to manipulate people's emotions um, or manipulate how people perceive events and reality, they leverage that. And to think they don't leverage that, I think would be really naive. So as an example, one that's like sort of well-known and easy to find if you search for it online, um, is Facebook attempting to uh, study how to manipulate people's emotions to make them feel like more negatively, like intentionally make them more depressed by bombarding them with like largely negative, 
news on their newsfeed, right? And so, you know, we can assume that they do that with all sorts of things and specific events. And when you consider the fact that we know now, um, and we've known for some time, quite frankly, that a lot of these companies, for example, selectively censor things, uh, you know, they're trying to cultivate the public's perception of mm-hmm. events and reality and, and all sorts of different things. And so social media is a big um tool for that and then also you know the whole like dopamine stuff with like um in like attention span impacts that you know social media and like stuff like tiktok and all of that is having on people um you know it's not really talked about enough and for those of us that lived a decent part of our lives without that stuff it affects us differently than like little kids that are exposed to that from extremely young ages and how does that affect the brain how does it affect socialization when all of that is still like developing um you know, I think a lot of that has had like mostly negative impacts and a lot of it doesn't get talked about. It gets normalized. And, uh, you know, there's a whole, I mean, we could do probably a whole podcast just discussing like all the different impacts that that has on people and, uh, and the type of impact it's had on different generations. Um, the uh, Another big problem, though, that does come up a lot in my work is the role of like how that data produced by all of this is harvested by intelligence agencies and then fed into AI tied up with like this blob of Silicon Valley national security stuff. Cause they really are fused. I mean, one, the, they're the private contractors for the intelligence agencies and there's a lot of overlap at this point um, uh, between them, but there's a lot of efforts to like predictively uh, or use AI predictively to see like, who's going to do what, or will this person commit a crime? Will this person do that before, you know, like this whole pre-crime mm-hmm. paradigm and all of this other stuff. And uh, we're seeing this uh, trouble push to sort of define alleged misinformation online, like treating that as like cyber terrorism or a cyber crime, that speech, online speech is, you know, becoming criminalized. It's not just like censoring, it's like moving into that other sphere. So there's a lot of um, problems there. And so like a lot of the people that own this technology that's having these other like psychosocial impacts, negative impacts, Uh, on humanity are also controlled by a very centralized group that has like very specific agendas. Um, In my opinion at this, I mean, they're essentially uh, in control of the U S government and they're like very, uh, I mean, I see them as pretty much overtly fascist at this point. A lot of the Silicon Valley billionaires very interested in having like very um, tight control uh, over the U S uh, political system. I mean, they do in terms of like political financing and stuff uh, of both parties and, uh, of over our media and just an insane amount of involvement with intelligence agencies, the military. As an example, like former CEO uh, of Google, Eric Schmidt is like funding major parts of the Biden administration right now. He's been a long time, big donor to, uh, the Democrats specifically, but he's basically like been in charge of national security AI policy. He was the chair of the National Security Commission on AI. And uh, if you like read the book he wrote on AI with Henry Kissinger, who is he basically described as his like mentor on this stuff. Um, it discusses a lot of these trends and talks about basically how AI is going to essentially, they don't call it a neo-feudal society, but they basically talk about how it's going to stratify society into two classes. And basically the people who like program and maintain and direct the uh, objectives of AI will be in like one class. And then uh, there's this large underclass that AI will act upon and they won't understand what AI is doing to them. And they also say that people that become dependent on AI for decision-making, for writing, for communicating, all sorts of stuff um, will become cognitively diminished. And I mean, we can already sort of see it happening to an extent with like how massive generative AI has become with like chat GPT, for example. You know, the whole idea that people have known for a long time, if you don't use it, you lose it. So, you know, if you use... You're a writer, for example, you use ChatGPT to write some stuff for you. Um, you know, maybe you do it occasionally at first, but then you become dependent on it and then you forget how to write without it. I mean, that's essentially what they're talking about. And that's where they're taking us with really every everything AI is offering to help us with. And ultimately, people that are so cognitively diminished, they can't understand what's happening to them while you have this programmer class at the top that's like directing how AI 
herds us all, they're openly talking about how this is going to be the impact of that technology. And it's Silicon Valley in bed with the national security state. It's like very over in, in your face. And the Silicon tech, uh, you know, the, the big billionaires of Silicon Valley, uh, they dominate our social media, our communication, um, in political discourse in a very significant way. They uh, are a major force in campaign donations. They dominate our politicians in a very significant way. Um, and like Eric Schmidt specifically too, is like funding all these guys in the Biden administration and controlling the science and technology policy of the Biden administration, directly funding people in the government, which is totally illegal, but it's happening anyway. Like you can have Politico do like three exposés on Eric Schmidt doing that. And there's no accountability. Uh, from like oversight offices in the government. They just don't do anything about it. They even tell Politico it's bad and nothing happens. I mean, that's mental. That tells you that we've like crossed the Rubicon, just people haven't realized it yet. You know what I mean? And if you define fascism as, you know, corporatism, like a fusing of the private and public sector, like we are there uh, when especially, and you can see it with the Silicon Valley stuff. Like it's not good. You know, it's crazy because so many people recognize how much money and donors influence politics in Washington, D.C., yet there's also this sort of complacency, like we can't do anything about it, so it just is the way it is. Um, you can stop you, using these guys' as products. <laughs> so you know, can I mean, do something easier, about it. I know, it's like easier said than done completely. It's time for a quick break to hear these messages from my partners who make this podcast possible. First up, Bitcoin 2024, the world's biggest Bitcoin conference, is coming to Nashville next year. Come join us for three full days of keynotes, panels, networking events, workshops, concerts, and more. Anything can happen here, especially if you dream of working in the industry. Ticket prices go up every month until the big event, so don't miss out. You want to get your tickets early. Head to b.tc slash conference and use the code HODL, H-O-D-L, for 10% off. I'll see you in Nashville. Next up, CoinKite, which offers everything you need to safely self-custody your Bitcoin. CoinKite produces the cold card wallet, which is the cold storage device I use for safekeeping my Bitcoin. You can verify the source code, it's ultra secure, and it's easy to use even if you're a beginner. Head to their site in my show notes to find all their custody products, cold cards in different colors, seed phrase plates, tap signers, block clocks, and more. And get a 5% discount using my link. Become your own bank with Bitcoin and CoinKite. Next up, CrowdHealth. Health insurance costs are sky high today, and you send your money every month to a massive corporation, and you never see that money again, even if you don't get sick. Luckily, there's another option, and it's all about community. CrowdHealth brings together Bitcoiners who crowdfund each other's healthcare, so you no longer have to pay fiat health insurance companies. You get to help other Bitcoiners, and they help you in return. So how it works is when someone needs a doctor or hospital visit, CrowdHealth negotiates down the medical bill lower than what insurance would be, and the community helps you fund the costs. You get to save the money you would have sent to insurance, and hey, why not put it into Bitcoin? For more information and to join, head to joincrowdhealth.com slash Natalie. You mentioned TikTok earlier, and one thing that I've been thinking about in the last couple of months is that you can invade a population in different ways. You can invade them physically through violence and the military or you could invade them with an illness. Um, you can invade their minds and capture this polarization and politicization because of our interactions online. And so if you were a policymaker, I mean, we've seen, we're seeing debates about TikTok right now. One of the presidential candidates, Nikki Haley, is basically saying that you're going to need an ID to go online and that's the way to control it. What's the right way to, I guess, moderate what's happening online, given all the things that you said that's so bad, especially with what young people are seeing? Do you think that there should be regulation? Like what, if you were a policymaker, what would you do to fix some of these problems? Would you do anything at all? Yeah. So I, I think the problem is like bigger than just like regulation. I think um, the problem is like what I laid out a second ago is that like Silicon Valley, which is making these products, uh, controls has too much political power for regulation to even like make sense really. Um, so like, as far as social media goes, there's like no actual discussion about like the psychosocial impacts really. Um, I mean, some of what you'll get is like fear mongering about like, Oh, TikTok in China. But you have to keep in mind too, that like a lot of TikTok executives at this point are like American and they have like a lot of weird overlaps with like 
hiring NATO veterans and like one of the big guys at like Disney, you know, it's not just like a CCP company. Like there's a lot of overlap. And even if you get on like, you know, just looking at transnational capital, like there is a lot of like back and forth between the US and China in terms of like the elite moneyed classes of both countries. You know, just as an example, you know, you have a lot of involvement of Steve Schwartzman of Blackstone Capital in China, like a lot of involvement. Uh, You have people like Elon Musk, uh, who have a lot of uh, business connections to China. Um, And he literally wants to turn Twitter, which he bought into American WeChat. Um, And, you know, the parent company of of like WeChat runs, not runs, but like has a huge stake in Tesla and is like one of their most active shareholders. Um, So, I mean, it's not a lot of times you'll get like sort of this uh, fear mongering stance about it. And it's like, of course, like. China probably does stuff like that, but they also obfuscate a lot of this other stuff that's going on um, at different levels. It doesn't get discussed. Our government most certainly does all the same stuff that they accuse China of doing to Americans too. Right. And so that oftentimes gets sort of divorced from the conversation. So if like the only political or conversation about it in like Washington is like, oh, we're worried about TikTok only and the CCP and all of this. And then that's how regulation comes into being. It's not going to fix any of these problems. Like it's just a um, sort of like an opportunistic way for them to make it look like they're doing something. But really, you know, our government will continue to do it to the American population, even if. China is not with their one app. And we have how many apps that are run by like cutouts of U.S. intelligence uh, operating social media right now? <laughs> um, you know, I don't really know if it's that easy to uh, to fix when it comes to like regulation, because like we've talked about on your show before, um, I think a lot of the issues like with the government and, you know, also with like Wall Street and, and, and banking, too, are... Um, not as easy a fix as people would like it to think because the system is just like too broken um, and it can't regulate itself. It can't investigate itself. Like there's definitely like a very serious break in that system. Um, And so there has to be an alternative built by us, the people in its place because the same people at the top that broke this current system are also building a new system, you know, for us to be herded into. And so, you know, there's a fork in the road regardless, like everyone knows the existing system is broken. So the answer at the end of the day about how to fix really all of this stuff is like, are we going to go into the new system that's being built for us or will we make our own system? And they're obviously going to be fundamentally different. One thing that I think is confusing is it literally says in the title, open AI, and one one thing that we have in the Bitcoin space we talk about is that a lot of the other tokens are decentralized in name only, dinos or dinos. And so it sounds like a lot of AI is open in name only. Would you agree with that? Yeah, well, I mean, open AI is like not an open source company. Like they don't make it clear, like, you know, their algorithms and all that stuff are like not transparent. So yeah, I mean, it's open in name only. Uh, for sure in that case. And I think a lot of people too just like see OpenAI as like its own thing, but really it's essentially like Microsoft at this point. So it's like part of the big tech thing, Um, you know, and Microsoft is involved with a lot of weird stuff going on with AI, specifically with like Windows. Like they're essentially saying like your data is not your data, it's our data. We take your data off of your Windows computer and feed it to our AI, like, that's a requirement you have to agree to, to use windows now. Um, and like, if you, if they decide to lock you out of your Microsoft account, for some reason, you lose all of your data. So your data is not your data on Microsoft now. And that is like an awful model business model to support. I think, and I, I hopefully other people feel that way too. Like, I don't want to use Microsoft products if that's how it's going to be, you know? Um, and so open AI is like partnered, with that same company that's in that same headspace um, and chat GPT is being used for like so much stuff and is being used to like replace people's jobs and potentially entire industries, specifically like staff writers and like more like low level, like news desk people. Like there's already major mm-hmm. publications that have entirely phased out their staff in that sense. Um, I don't think that's something we should really be supporting. I certainly uh, don't, I mean, again, if you want to understand like 
what these trends are that like powerful people know these trends and where they expect it to take us go and read the Henry Kissinger, Eric Schmidt AI book. I mean, they lay it out for everyone. It's not good. (laughs) Well, and to your earlier point, I mean, the tools are beneficial. It makes things a little bit faster, especially with regards to research, but could you down the road also lose your critical thinking skills and your ability to write? Um, and I, I thought about that with regards to ChatGPT. One last question I wanted to ask you about AI before we pivot to your recent investigative work about Binance and FTX and CBDCs. Um, I heard actually Vivek Ramaswamy on the campaign trail share something really interesting um, that goes to the heart of the, the question about AI. And he said that when he was young, he was a ball boy and that... Um, the players would always argue and say, no, the ball was in, you know, they would argue with the ball boys and with the the people making the calls. And then AI came out and the players stopped arguing. And I guess they trusted the software and, and the artificial intelligence more than people. And so what he said he feared was that it wasn't AI as a tool. It was people's reaction to the AI and the trust that we put into um, what, what what they're building. Would you agree with that? And and how do you want people to look at this? Because again, we're going to have very few options like we do in the social media world. And with a lot of these big tech companies, do we either forego it or how do we use it responsibly? Yeah. So I think it's a little more complicated than sort of like this picture uh, Ramaswamy is painting. Um, And there's a lot of different examples of that. So um, first off, the AI industry, like any other large industry um, that has a lot of money being thrown around in it, um, there's corruption, right? And there's companies that like oversell how effective their AI algos are. So like uh, one example that like I wrote about several years ago uh, was this Israeli company that was hired by uh, Rhode Island during COVID to predictively... Uh, say when COVID outbreaks would happen before they happen based on like various metrics from like the Rhode Island Department of Health. And the company said their algorithm was like 75, 76% accurate. Um, But that was never audited. That's like the company's own statistics. So those are probably like buffed up a significant amount. So let's say the real number is somewhere in like the 50% ballpark. Let's know better than like flipping a coin, is it? So like, what are we paying for there? And what, and the the big problem is what happens, it's not so much about like people, regular people's trust. It's also about like, what happens when the state or like law enforcement or government give AI algorithms power over people's lives that are not accurate and should not be trusted and are not vetted. It's just that company got the contract because they have connections. That happens with every other industry. Why would it not happen with AI? What happens when a company, um, a facial recognition company with connections to a Silicon Valley billionaire that paid and donated to this politician's campaign or whatever gets the contract, you know, to do live facial recognition for law enforcement in various counties or an entire state? And, uh, you know, they identify people and it's, it's extremely inaccurate or it's, uh, you know, racially biased, which has been a a problem for several years, well-known and documented about law enforcement use of uh, facial recognition. Um, those are big issues. It's actually happened to a very significant degree already in the United Kingdom, uh, where you have, uh, they know, like the Met Police know it's inaccurate and it's causing problems and identifying the wrong people, but they're not going to try and change the company. They're not phasing out live facial recognition. It seems like they don't care it's inaccurate and that accuracy isn't the point. You know, it's more of creating the the Foucaultian uh, panopticon where everyone knows they're being watched and so they behave or they're more likely to be behave and more likely to be controlled. And some of these big companies like Palantir, like literally have pictures of folk cult, like in their offices and in their promo material and like all of this stuff, like they, some of these guys think that way, you know? So AI becomes a lot more complicated than it's not just like how regular people down on the bottom levels react to it. It's also like, why are we, why is the government in, in these other entities giving so much power to AI technology that isn't proven and isn't vetted? There's a lot of overhype in AI. We also know that there's accuracy issues with AI. There's a, there's a thing, for example, called like AI hallucinations where it like 
returns output that just doesn't oh, yeah. exist. And then you have people right. like Kissinger and Schmidt in their book argue that what AI is seeing in those cases is a different reality that just humans can't see, that we should trust in the AI's delusions, essentially, and have that supersede our own perception of reality because AI is so much smarter than, a, I mean, that, that that's madness. That's like a collective delusion. Um, but the problem is when you have it like doing facial recognition for law enforcement or what we're seeing with Gaza right now, AI being cho choosing who lives and who dies, or it, you know, that's also being fielded in Ukraine too, like AI and warfare before you know this this more recent conflict in the middle east broke out uh that has major impacts and they seem to not care about the accuracy it's not more accurate you can just have machine go on autopilot and you're not going to have humans in the equation saying that's immoral i'm not going to kill uh i'm not going to bomb that house with kids in it you know the machine's not going to do that you know what i mean right so and then it's like who do you hold accountable who's responsible i think we just saw in the last week um there was like a rogue robot that hurt an employee at tesla or yeah. one of elon musk's factories right yeah well the accountability thing is another big thing because it's basically like the analogy i use for this is like the wizard of oz you know like ai is the ultimate wizard of oz for the ruling class like they can just literally do whatever they want and say, oh, well, we're just doing what the AI algo said. And it's so smart and it can't, this is in the Schmidt Kissinger book too. It's so smart. It can't explain itself. We just have to do what it says because it's so smart. Okay. That's wild. Um, okay. Um, no, because I mean, if it can't explain itself, it can't justify its actions and everyone has to essentially through blind faith and some sort of like religious like devotion believe that it's smarter without proof because it's being hyped as that you know and and just basically outsource how we perceive reality and events to like algorithms being designed by these silicon valley crazy people <laughs> like no. Well, and <laughs> algorithms are going to be impacting our financial system more and more. So I, I do want to pivot to your recent work um, because you did, you connected the dots with um, the Farmington Bank that was connected to FTX's trading arm Alameda Research, which uh, Farmington transitioned into Moonstone Bank. And then mm -hmm. that has some interesting connections with some entities in the Middle East, as well as banks that are creating the CBDC. So 30,000 feet view, like what, what do people need? to know okay yeah so you may remember from the ftx scandal last year that there was like this weird bank in rural washington that's like basically like broom closet size like one branch bank that had like less mm -hmm. than uh significantly less than like 10 like 10 million dollars in deposits um before it was bought by this entity called fbh corp which was basically uh, the current chief compliance officer of Binance, Noah Perlman, plus Jean Chalopin, the chairman of Deltec, which is uh, known for being a big bank for FTX, but is also one of the biggest banks for Tether, USDT, right? And uh, these guys, and there were a couple other people there. There's another Deltec guy and another guy I can't quite remember, but they're the ones that bought Farmington from this other guy named Archie Chan. Um, and I wrote about Archie Chan specifically in his history last year. Um, but basically Farmington got, after it was bought by Chalopin and, and, and these guys, uh, started to undergo this transition from being this rural community bank, one of the smallest banks in the country, to trying to become part of the Federal Reserve System, changing their name to Moonstone, trying to become the bank of the future and being involved specifically in like the cryptocurrency space and also like in marijuana, uh, legal marijuana and like a, just a, a huge transformation uh, was underway there. Um, and it, it, Noah Perlman, who I mentioned earlier, was like on the board of Moonstone. Also, uh, Jalopin, obviously very involved, as was his son, Javier uh, Jalopin, who was chief digital officer of Moonstone. And um, pretty much around the same time, uh, like very small, like a couple days difference, I think, uh, Alameda, Alameda Research poured like 11.5 million uh, into this bank, which was like at the time twice what they were, the whole bank was worth. Um, and then they swell in like less than a year from 10 millions in deposits to like 84 million. And like, 
74 million of that was just from four accounts and 50 million of that was one account tied to Sam Bankman Freed that was titled FTX Digital Markets. So you have Sean Jalapin, Dell Tech, you have SBF and FTX and Dell Tech and FTX are obviously connected. And they're basically uh, using this, trying to use this tiny bank for something. And based on just what was, what is documentable, um, there's no way this bank should have been approved by the Fed. It should never have been made part of the Fed system. Um, and the Federal Reserve system can't explain, refuses to explain still how they approved it and why. Uh, and there's also the same sort of like, no comment, nothing to see here, even though like, yes, local reporter, you bring up good points. Uh, they were, they were irrelevant to us at the time or something from like Washington financial regulators. And uh, if you want more details on that, you can look in the, in the two pieces I've, I've written about it, but there's definitely something very weird there. Like there was somebody in the fed system that got this approved when it should not have been approved and even high people up at the fed are covering that up that's essentially what's happening here um and so what was you know it, <clears throat> ftx collapses and all this scrutiny obviously gets placed on this tiny bank even from mainstream media and also from congressmen like it was obviously like something was going on there and it was very obvious to see and then the Fed has since like issued like enforcement actions against Farmington and like forced it to close down. And so it doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. But they had big plans for it before FTX unraveled. And that's essentially what this piece is about. It's about um, the partnership they made right before they all of the FTX started to go to crap and just like explode, you know, um, and is basically around this company called Fluent Finance that had partnered uh, with Moonstone and Fluent Finance was specifically looking to, through partnering with Moonstone, spur mass adoption of a uh, U.S. dollar pig stable coin called U.S. Plus uh, that was basically marketing itself without saying it by name, but naming Tether, basically like a trustworthy Tether. So why are, you know, Dell Tech and FTX very tied up with Tether, including well, you know, well before FTX went under, um, just like a very known relationship there, you know, why are they using this other entity that they're hiding behind essentially to get involved with this new dollar pig stable coin that's trustworthy and like regulatory compliant. And there's been a lot of speculation for a long time that Tether's not going to make the cut when regulations come into force because of like, you know, where are their reserves and all this stuff. Like there's always been a lot of controversy around like Tether and reserves and like other, you know, aspects of, how, how Tether functions, you know, and there's like some trust issues for them. Uh, and so, you know, it seems like they were trying to like get, you know, involved with this new stable coin. And there's a lot of intrigue and a lot of still, you know, unanswered questions, but I figured like looking closely at Fluent Finance and like what they've done in the year since all of this essentially unraveled for FTX and Moonstone, like maybe we can find out where, you know, uh, Moonstone had originally planned to go. And I, I think it's pretty fair to see that, yeah, I mean, they were angling to be essentially, um, you know, the de facto CBDC of the United States. Uh, because as, you know, and we can get into this in a little bit, but <clears throat> why this really matters, why this piece really matters is because it explains very well, I think, um, why the U.S. is not going to get a CBDC, but it is going to get a CBDC. What do I mean by that? The U.S. is going to get the same surveillable, programmable digital currency garbage that is being pushed in other countries, but is going to be in those cases is directly issued by the central bank. The U.S. is going to get that same thing, but it's not going to be issued directly by the Fed. It's going to be issued by the commercial banks, the big banks, the too big to fail banks who are going to basically issue a bunch of stable coins and back those reserves up at the Fed, that's called a synthetic CBDC. The U.S. is going to get a synthetic CBDC and people are going to cheer and say, U.S. stands for freedom. We don't have a CBDC, but you do because it's still surveillable and it's still programmable. Instead of Jerome Powell programming your digital dollar, it's Jamie Dimon. Is that a victory? I don't think so.
It's time for another quick break to hear these messages from my partners. I'm excited to share that I'm an advisor for the Orange Pill app. If you haven't downloaded this app yet, you're missing out on connecting with Bitcoiners in your area. The Orange Pill app is focused on building the social layer for Bitcoin and helping create opportunities for in-person connections and community building. You create a profile and you'll see lots of familiar faces. And then you can search for Bitcoiners and Bitcoin events based on your location. I'm geotagged in my home base, St. Louis, and I'm excited that Orange Pill app has allowed me to meet new people in my city. Come join us, use my referral code in the show notes and start connecting today. This show is also brought to you by iTrust Capital. iTrust lets you invest in Bitcoin for your retirement with the tax benefits of an IRA. You can defer taxes on gains using a crypto IRA or with a Roth IRA, you can withdraw tax-free at retirement. You can sign up for an account and get a $100 bonus at itrust.capital slash Natalie Brunel. Next up, I want to take a moment to recommend an outstanding recent book in the Bitcoin space, Bitcoin Evangelism by Brian DeMint. I've had the chance to have Brian on the show, and this is really the ultimate tool for orange pilling your friends, your family, your coworkers, and it will make you a more effective messenger for Bitcoin. We all have that story of how we disregarded Bitcoin the first time we heard about it because either the arguments weren't compelling enough or maybe they weren't framed in a way that we could easily grasp them. Think of something like trustlessness or immutability. These are concepts that now we understand as Bitcoiners, but how do you explain them simply to someone totally new in the space? Well, Bitcoin evangelism will help you do that. It will allow you to become a Bitcoin evangelist so that we orange pill millions of new Bitcoiners in the new year. Head to the link in my show notes to buy the book today. Well, that's something that we talked about in the last episode where we, we discussed sort of the fragility of the overall system and how the big banks were yeah. consolidating into fewer and fewer and how that would lend to um, the eventual release of a CBDC. But, you know, mm -hmm. it, it begs the question, will Bitcoin address some of these issues? Because I think a lot of people think that a CBDC is inevitable and it will um, have, you know, use cases for, for some people who maybe are going to pay taxes in those CBDCs. But, but with regards to opting out and having an alternative, some people would say that it looks like the government, regulators, um, even Wall Street, they're, they're approving Bitcoin, they're adopting Bitcoin, they're creating products around Bitcoin to allow more and more people to have access to it. And so Bitcoin's sort of winning in that sense. Would you agree? Winning? Uh, I don't know if I necessarily agree with it, under those metrics, I certainly think that uh, the big commercial banks and potentially, you know, the financial arm of the U.S. government think they can use Bitcoin for something that benefits them. Um, so it, just to, you know, f before I go any further, I mean, I think it's pretty clear to everyone that there's a big differentiation, even from the U.S. government's perspective between Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies, right? Gary Gensler of the SEC refers to Bitcoin as a commodity, but every other cryptocurrency is a security from the SEC's perspective. That's pretty significant. So seeing Bitcoin as like this commodity from the SEC's perspective, perspective the only commodity in the digital currency space, they obviously wanna use that to their benefit if they can. And it seems like they probably can and will, yeah? Um, so the conflict here as I see it is why was Bitcoin originally made, you know, uh, from what, I have what's been portrayed, right? It was created as a tool of financial freedom uh, to prevent fiscal irresponsibility on the part of central banks and also commercial banks as a response to things like the 2008 financial crisis, okay? So what happens when the same powers that Bitcoin uh, was created to thwart um, start using it to continue their bad behavior. Is it still a tool for financial freedom then, or has it become a tool of the same people it was created to fight against? This is a real discussion that needs to happen in the Bitcoin space. It is happening to a degree, arguably not enough. I think a lot of people, um, you know, can get kind of googly eyed thinking like, oh, wow, what if Bitcoin goes above $200,000? Like, and all of this stuff, like, okay, well, it, it's great that you might have, you know, a higher net worth. But in a lot of the cases where like Bitcoin would be projected to read astronomical sums, that means like the dollar and like other currencies widely in use become like insanely devalued. 
So like, okay, um, if a loaf of bread is worth like $300 <laughs> because like helicopter money in the US has happened and it's like hyperinflation and you have Bitcoin, like you're standing, you might have like a lot of, you know, a, a lot, like a lot of, it looks like you have a lot of money in your account, but in terms of purchasing power, like you basically have the same lifestyle you have now, but everyone else around you is dirt poor and has nothing. Like, is that a scenario to be like cheered on? I don't think so. It, this is, uh, Bitcoin's supposed to be ideal money, right? And a tool of financial freedom. And if we let the people that have run this insane monetary casino for decades use Bitcoin for their ends, Bitcoin will cease to be that, period. Um, I also think there's a, a, a side effort too, and I think it's very obvious or should be very obvious to, to people in the space uh, to criminalize privacy enhancing tools for Bitcoin transactions. They want Bitcoin transactions, those that they allow to happen, um, to be completely surveillable. They don't want financial privacy, which is part of this push for stay, uh, you know, bank issued stable coins and deposit tokens and CBDCs is all about knowing everything about the flow of money you know, how the public spends their money. They don't want you to spend $1 and them not know about it, you know? So, I mean, that's essentially where it's headed. And they, if to use Bitcoin, they want it to go in that direction as well. Um, so, you know, it's very likely like in the event that like the dollar hyperinflates, like, you know, uh, people have made the case that like maybe Bitcoin will be used as a reserve asset to keep the dollar from completely imploding, you know? Like if the U.S. is going to default on its debt and we're like, what, at like 34 trillion now? I mean, it's like completely insane. And it's not like going to be addressed, the debt problem. So obviously it will explode at some point. So, I mean, uh, people have to be very cognizant of like these efforts to use Bitcoin for ends that are like not good in terms of like the original ethos of Bitcoin. So people kind of have the, in my opinion, have to pick a side here about like, are you going to fight to keep Bitcoin a tool for financial freedom for everybody and to keep it being like ideal money to, to as a hedge against central bank and commercial bank malfeasance, or are you going to let those same central and commercial banks uh, use it for their ends and, and incorporate it into their system of complete financial control. I think it's a very, I think it's very easy to choose what side to be on there. Um, but some people again, you know, are like, Ooh, the prospect of being a millionaire sounds great. But like, if you to, you know, maintain the lifestyle you have now in a hyperinflation scenario costs a million dollars. I mean, that's not great uh, either. And, you know, if every, all your transactions are surveillable and all of the stuff, I mean, maybe you have more money, but like, you know, the system they're trying to like usher in, commit a thought crime and the DOJ will just come and seize all your Bitcoin. Like they do to tons of people, you know, I mean, it, there's certain stuff we, we have to stand against, or it just, it gets bad for everybody. It doesn't matter how much Bitcoin you hold. I think you bring up really important points about how we have to build tools that will preserve privacy with Bitcoin, that will protect the right to self-custody. That's one thing that a lot of Bitcoiners are getting super involved with, with regards to mm -hmm. advocacy against bills like Elizabeth Warren's anti-crypto bill. We also have to build more tools to ensure network decentralization. But I will say what gives me hope is that no matter what company comes in or if nation states want to adopt it as a reserve currency, Bitcoin is immutable to change and can't be captured or co-opted in the way that all these other forms of money can be. And my biggest hope with Bitcoin is that it does empower people economically. So if, if they, they can at least just store their value in something that's not going to be ripped away from them and diluted by inflation they can make some more decisions. They will have the freedom. They will have more options to choose what lifestyle is right for them and maybe take themselves to a country where they feel safer or where they feel their views are more represented. Would you agree with any of that? I mean, to an extent, but you have to keep in mind too that there's major efforts to like co-opt all the on and off ramps in Bitcoin. So like even in that scenario, like if you have a lot of Bitcoin, but like you can't use it or exchange it for legal tender, you know, you'd, you'd only be able to like use it with other people that have Bitcoin, right? And so yeah. like, there's a potential for that to emerge at some point, probably in certain 
uh, scenarios. But as it is right now, I mean, there's an unprecedented effort by like the DOJ specifically to get like major crypto exchanges under its thumb by making them, uh, well, I mean, the Binance thing is a good example, right? So like looking at Binance, what's happened Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, an insane amount of staff from the Department of Justice are surveilling every transaction that goes through Binance right now. And uh, FinCEN has custodianship of the exchange for the next five years. They have all access to all of Binance's data, not just from the settlement forward, but all of their past data. So they can retroactively go and flag transactions and the DOJ can be like, we're going to seize that wallet for X amount of Bitcoin and add it to, you know, the DOJ's massive uh, Bitcoin holdings, which are among the biggest in the world. Right. So you control all of these on and off ramps and surveil all of that. Like that is a major problem. Yeah. And uh, I think people have to be really aware of this like big push to end uh, online anonymity and financial anonymity or like just privacy uh, that I've been talking about for a long time. So like, you know, um, obviously like Bitcoin has potential to be something, but if we let these people control the on and off ramps and like other major aspects of infrastructure, like maybe Bitcoin itself is immutable, but they plan to do everything in their power to prevent it from being something that uh, takes a takes a big chunk of their power away. And I think people have to be like, I, I mean, some people are naive about how far these people will go, but you should not be like, these are people that do not want to cede their power to anybody. And they're very accustomed to stealing from us. Um, and they don't plan to stop stealing, you know? <laughs> uh, so, I mean, people need to be really um, aware of that and, um, you know, uh, and, and fight to keep Bitcoin to be something that is empowering and a tool for freedom mm -hmm. and financial freedom. Because, you know, if enough people uh, get too googly eyed about the value going up and, you know, yeah, pumper bags and all of this stuff. I mean, there's a lot that could a lot of damage could be done. And, you know, um, I mean, I wish I had more like positive stuff to say about it, but I mean, it's not like the battle is lost. Like, I'm not saying that. What I'm trying to say is people need to be really aware that there are major efforts to co-opt. Like maybe there's aspects of it, sure, that like can't be co-opted, but in a practical sense, like for regular people, it can be co-opted. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a, when you have groups like BlackRock and all this stuff trying to get in on it, that should be a red flag that like they think they can co-opt it, you know? Yeah. I mean, I think these uh, conversations should be had and it, I, I think we should have these thoughtful debates. And in the future, I see, you know, 10, 20 years out, I don't think the majority of people will want to custody their own Bitcoin. We on these shows, we always say, not your keys, not your coins. And we tell people to do it. And I have tutorials on how to do it. And I think people should. But unfortunately, I think the majority of people will end up trusting a third party, which you're right, to your point. I mean, I have the white paper literally right behind me talking about the problem with trusting third parties and intermediaries and how central banks have let, let us down by devaluing currencies. The point of Bitcoin is that it is uh, an asset with no issuer that you can take custody of. So I hope people learn to do that, but you're absolutely right. Um, these are things to be really aware of. I know we have only a little bit of time left, but I did want to ask you about something you've also been writing about recently, which is election simulations. I know, I think this year, this coming year is going to be so crazy with regards to elections, all the information that's out there. Um, and one thing you've talked about, which I love and repeat on my shows is we shouldn't have a political savior. And we seem to ping pong back and forth yeah. between red and blue and red and blue. And every everything for the average person just seems to get harder and they get poorer. Um, so what can you share about the upcoming election and these simulations? Okay. So, um, Actually, it's not new reporting. It's uh, I did a series on this company that was doing very weird election simulations in the beginning of 2020, uh, specifically a company called Cyber Reason. Yeah, and in in that same that same year, I was also writing about another company that's sort of gotten tied up in this called CTI League that recently has gotten some coverage uh, from uh, Michael Schellenberger and Matt Taibbi. Um, as part of the whole censorship yeah. discussion, but they obviously, uh, as I've been noting, and as I noted in my, my re reports on them from 2020 have been a lot involved in a lot more than that. Um, 
So basically this company called Cyber Reason was conducting uh, unusual, I would say, uh, simulations with uh, the Department of Homeland Security, the FBI and law enforcement in the US. They're not a they're not a company of founded by Americans, by the way. Um, they're all like veterans and still active more or less, um, you know, of Israeli intelligence services. And they basically conducted these simulations of uh, what types of ev hacks and events, cyber attacks, uh, could trigger the cancellation of a U.S. presidential election um, and the declaration of martial law. And so there's been some people that have been concerned that they made that you know, it seems like something that might happen next election cycle. Um, I don't really know. I do know that it's very likely there's going to be some sort of cyber 9-11 style event next year. Um, and that's unsettling. Uh, it is a U.S. presidential election year next year, but it's also a presidential election a year in about half of the countries of the world. So I'm sure next mm. year is going to be much more turbulent than this year was. Um, in terms of stuff on on that scale. Um, and then you have these groups like the one of the top guys at the World Economic Forum saying a massive cyber attack uh, is likely, is not likely, but is going to come before January 2025, which of course we're in December 2023. That implies it's going to be in 2024. And this is the same group that during COVID was like, well, just wait for the cyber pandemic and it's going to be worse than COVID and all of this stuff. So... Which, by the way, the uh, World Economic Forum has a partnership against cybercrime that I've talked a lot, including at the Bitcoin yeah. conference earlier this year in May. And on our show, yeah. And here as well. Uh, it's run by a career Israeli intelligence guy named Tal Goldstein. Um, it's very tied up with the biggest banks in the world, including some of the two big to fail banks from the U.S., Bank of America, um, and intelligence agencies of the U.S., U.K., and Israel. Um, that have these explicit plans to end both online and financial anonymity online and specifically um, attack crypto as a terror financing tool, which has been circulated in mainstream media and then debunked, but it still creates the impression specifically that Bitcoin is the money of terrorists. And this is an mm -hmm. overt effort to criminalize even further the use of mixers. So of course you have people that have created mixers yeah. that have gotten in legal trouble, but the goal is to have anyone that uses a mixer get in legal trouble, which is a significant escalation. And we're seeing efforts worldwide to end uh, the use of encryption by individuals. All of this is very significant. And there's a reason they're criminalizing Bitcoin specifically for that. And this is part of this broader effort we spoke about earlier to co-opt Bitcoin. Uh, and they want to use this national security justification to take that as far as they can take it. Yeah. Um, I don't think they would necessarily want to illegalize Bitcoin because if that were true, why is the DOJ holding so much? <laughs> mm -hmm. um, you know, there's obviously, I think they see some utility in holding it for a reason, uh, but they definitely don't want it to, they don't want to have private Bitcoin transactions. And so that's what this whole effort about linking Bitcoin and terror financing is about. Um, it's made up essentially that claim as i've talked about in the past and keep in mind that this wef partnership with these intelligence agencies and these banks also includes chain analysis which is the company often used to say oh this terror group you know took bitcoin from this and that you know hmm. so they're in bed with them keep that in mind when chain analysis is the source cited as why bitcoin is bad for whatever yeah so uh they're going to try and throw the book at it. And, you know, like Elizabeth Warren is like the main front person in Congress for all of these initiatives and her recent exchange with Jamie Dimon, where he's like, we should illegalize crypto precisely because Jamie Dimon wants to issue the stable coins and wants to issue the crypto. They want to take fintechs out and they want to be the guys doing that. And they want to use Bitcoin as a commodity in the space, as like maybe collateral as a reserve for something. But they want everyone in the U.S. to have the deal with their bank issued deposit tokens and stable coins. That is the plan. It's nuts. It's just like literally Fox is in charge of the hen house uh, to an unbelievable degree. It just it's it's madness. Um, but yeah, there's this huge effort that people cannot ignore to go after financial privacy and Bitcoin specifically. Um, and it's all very much tied up with this whole cyber attack taking down the financial system. So if you are the financial system and you 
uh, know that the banking sector is in major shit. Yeah, and is going to collapse anyway. And you want to avoid a repeat of 2008 where people blamed the banks and were mad at the banks. How do you do that? Well, a cyber attack comes along, your systems go down, right? And you can blame faceless hackers, literally whoever you want, a random group that uses Bitcoin, a nation state that you want to trigger war with, North Korea, China, Iran, Russia, whatever. All four of them, I don't know. Um, and uh, the banks are absolved and they're like, well, we have to know who everyone is to prevent this from happening again. So no more online privacy and we can't, we have to stop these terrorists from getting money. So we have to surveil all crypto transactions. Um, we have to illegalize the use of mixers and all. I mean, they have planned it out. I mean, maybe it sounds conspiratorial, but um, these guys love to steal and they don't want you to be mad at them for stealing and they want to keep did stealing. You, That's how Did it you works. see that Netflix movie, Leave the World Behind, about the cyber attack? I did not, but I heard about it. I don't have Netflix. So, um, but yeah, I mean, there's a lot of this signaling, not even just for like from entertainment, uh, but also like these claims that, you know, mm -hmm. China's infiltrating our systems and Iran's hacking water supplies and invariably the companies cited there right. um, have no evidence. And if you actually read like several paragraphs down, they'll tell you they don't have evidence for at, at least blame attribution yeah. for saying yeah. it's this country or that, but you'll get the headline that blames the nation state and that's what sticks in people's heads. So a good example, um, the recent like China infiltrating our national security systems thing, first of all, it was not an attack. They were claiming to have found actors they alleged were tied to China in systems and they didn't do anything. They were just seen there. Yeah. And the group that attributed this to being a Chinese group is a company called Recorded Future that was founded with money from the CIA directly from NQTEL. Um, so trust them as much as you want, I guess. Um, and they also like didn't have any real evidence to say why it was China. And this is a consistent thing with like these nation state attribution things. Right. Um, so one of the guys I wrote about that created the CTI league that's come up recently um, is this guy named Ohad Zadenberg. And he's been responsible for years for attributing blame for different hacks to Iran. And a lot of times he'll just be like medium to high probability because this guy's believed, believed work history uh, overlaps with this guy from a previous Iranian group, uh, but they won't say how much the overlap is. They won't say what the previous Iranian group was. I mean, yeah. it's just like, that's not enough to justify going right. to war with, uh, but you're putting this report out saying Iran attacked us like right after uh, the U.S. assassinated Qasem Soleimani, the Iranian general, and there was all this hype about like Iran's going to attack the U.S. with a cyber attack and Mike Pompeo and Trump were like, we'll nuke Iran, basically, if they do that. I mean, very sensitive stuff. You're going to put that kind of like claim and that's the only evidence you have medium to high probability mm -hmm. based on someone's believed unconfirmed work history. And you're a guy tied up with Israeli intelligence who's been trying to like get the U.S. to preemptively strike Iran first for a very long time. And have like an right. admitted intelligence policy. I mean, we need to do that. Um, yeah, we've seen this time and again, and with sense. Iraq. And you're right; mm -hmm. there's either no evidence, or at best, um, a small, tiny fraction of what's actually occurring is used as the excuse to eliminate some of our freedoms and our rights. Um, and one yeah. thing that you said, Whitney, because I know that exactly. And here, here's the other thing. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Just really quick, I want to say, even if Russia, China, Iran, North Korea, whatever, I'll get blamed for this stuff. These guys and the West are all down to eliminate online anonymity and financial privacy for all of their citizens. Yeah, the US and China agree on that. US and Iran agree on that. They're all doing digital IDs and either synthetic CBDCs or direct issued CBDCs. They're all on board for this overarching agenda. Just wanna make that really clear. Well, one thing that you've said is no one's gonna come save you. We have to save ourselves. We have to build uh, locally and and take the steps to be as sovereign as we can uh, by Bitcoin as part of that. Um, I'm I'm so sad that we're out of time, but Whitney, any final thoughts? What do you want to leave the the viewers and listeners with? Well, I guess sort of where we started, right? So like some people hear this stuff and get black pilled and worried, but like instead get excited and let's go out and build some stuff so we don't have to use these crazy people's tools and we can just use our own tools. 
you know, and much better tools at that, that like actually work for the people and are made by people for people, you know, and not like made by oligarchs to force people to serve the oligarchs, you know, let's not do that. Like, let's get excited about building something new and better instead of being like all black pilled and depressed. We can do stuff about it. We just have to like get out of the armchair mm -hmm. and like start building. And that's like what humans are meant to do. Get out and do and build stuff. We're not meant to like sit, you know, in a, in, on our couch with a VR headset on and just like be like that all day. Like, no, we're supposed to get up and like build stuff and make things and create. That's what humans are supposed to do. So instead of being like cognitively diminished by like the Kissinger Schmidt AI and sitting there with your like Oculus Facebook headset on, let's go out and build real stuff and real tools and like, you know, use Bitcoin for financial freedom like it's supposed to be. And all these other like this technology doesn't have to be bad it can but we have to get out and build it ourselves and there's people that can do that and there's people in the space that can be supported to do that if you don't know how to do that so let's go you know very well said whitney and i think the numbers are on our side <laughs> i think billions of people want to see the kind of world that that we do so um here's to hoping for that thank you so much for joining me again in the show notes you can find all of whitney's work i highly recommend checking it out and make sure if you haven't get her book one nation under blackmail it's phenomenal. It's it's like an encyclopedia is in this woman's brain, and I'm so impressed. Um, thanks so much, Whitney, for all your time. Thank you so much for checking out the video version of my show. Remember, this podcast is for educational and entertainment purposes only. Nothing constitutes as official investment advice, and you should always do your own research. Please reach out if you have guest suggestions or any feedback. My email is natalie at talkingbitcoin.com, and I'll see you next time.